Hi everyone, and thanks for attending today's webinar, How to Make Financial Advice Inclusive for the Entire Family. Um, I'm going to introduce today's speaker, um, Kendall Flutie from Banker will be presenting. She's the co-founder and CEO of Banker, the financial education platform used by more than 50,000 Australian and New Zealand primary students. Banker, Banker lets children experience per personal finances firsthand in their classroom via an online virtual economy. They get to explore financial lessons such as savings and compound interest, paying taxes, exploring the property market, the benefits of super, superannuation and much more. And NetWealth, we're really proud to be partnering with Banker to bring this program to 15,000 Australian kids. And we're very excited to have Kendall here today to present to you. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for tuning in today. It's great to know that there are so many passionate advisors out there wanting to incorporate financial education into your everyday practice. Um, so yeah, I'm Kendall Flutie, co-founder and CEO of Banker. Um, I've also got along with me here today, Liz Phelan. She leads up Banker here in Australia. Liz is at the coalface of financial education in schools. So I thought it was relevant to bring her along if there are any questions specifically around financial education in schools and some of the products we talk to in that space, Liz is gonna be your go-to. Um, so just a little bit about my background. I'm a former big four accountant. I threw that all in and retrained in software development and worked in a software development firm for a while. Um, we worked with a number of clients, the big banks, um, the stock exchange, and we also had some in-house SaaS products as well. So I got a really good breadth of some software experience that they are stacked onto my accounting background. But today, um, I really want to just talk all about making financial advice inclusive for the whole family. And that puts a particular spotlight on kids in the family because typically kids won't be your standard clients, right? But I've really seen that kids are far more capable to comprehend financial concepts than we give them credit for. So there's a real opportunity in terms of bringing kids into that financial fold and conversing with them around topics that we usually wouldn't consider they were capable of. But secondly, in terms of your more traditional clients, their parents, it also offers them the ability to sort of become the educator. And that really reinforces some of the things that you'll be talking to them about. Um, and it also sort of standardizes in the family some of those newly formed behaviors as well. So to dive into things, this is what we're gonna cover off together. Um, but to ensure that everyone's on the same footing from a knowledge-based perspective, we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about the foundations. What is financial literacy? Um, and then we'll progress on to the current state of financial literacy here in Australia. But particularly, again, that focus will be on children. Um, I don't want to linger too long. I don't want to preach to the choir. Um, but in terms of getting the most out of the latter part, the meatier part of the content, I figure it's, it's best to ensure we're all at the same page. Um, so consider those first two agenda items, our foundations, and then we're going to progress on to the really good stuff. What tools are actually out there in the market today that you can implement and use either as an advisor going along and extending your reach or introducing them to your clients and sort of um, improving what services you can offer. But by the end of the session, together I want to make sure everyone's capable and confident to have those financial literacy conversations with their clients in the wider community. And also, I'm hoping that we'll be able to put together the bones of a basic toolbox for you. And we're going to touch on what a toolbox is later on. Um, lastly, this is a webinar, so let's make the most of that and um, employ some of the technology we have at our disposal. I want to hear from you, any questions you have, um, send them through and I'll be able to answer them. I'm going to have a bit of a pause at each of the end of these four agenda items. So if you do have questions, ask them at the end of each of those so it can be more relevant. Um, if take a while for those questions to form though, I'll definitely, definitely open up to questions at the end as well. Lastly, I'm going to be preparing a cheat sheet, a financial education cheat sheet for everyone who's attending today. Um, so if I dive or touch, into, touch on things that you'd like me to dive deeper into, do let me know as well via the question and answers um, section and I can include links or go over anything that I haven't had the time to really explore today and pre present that to you on the cheat sheet. All right, let's get into it. 
what is financial literacy? Defining financial literacy should be a lot more straightforward than it is. Uh, and the reason that it's more complex than it should be is that geographically different regions define what financial literacy is differently. But on top of that, a lot of large financial institutions have also taken the liberty to define financial literacy themselves. And each time it's defined, we use different nuances and different terminology, which can actually confuse the whole situation. I think intuitively everyone tuned in today will think of financial literacy the same. Um, but let's make sure of that. Let's really just put it out on the table that this is what financial literacy is. When I look for a definition in a country of financial literacy, I usually look for the governing body, the person or organisation setting the strategy around financial literacy. And obviously here in Australia, that's ASIC's role. Um, they're responsible for leading and coordinating the improvement of financial literacy for all Australians. So this is their definition here. And if you look at it, it's actually quite interesting because the word literacy, which we typically tend to associate with knowledge in a particular area, is, is used. Um, we've got knowledge, but then we dive a little bit deeper and we talk about skills, attitudes and behaviours. And the semantics here actually play a really, really big part um, because literacy is, as we would see it, the first step on the progression to financial capability. Where everyone's heading in terms of semantics in the financial literacy world is to progressing through to using instead the phrase financial capability. And I'm going to be doing that throughout this webinar. ASIC has actually recent, re recently announced that they're going to be progressing to financial capability as well because it enhances and encapsulates a more holistic approach to financial ability um, it doesn't just sit on that layer of knowledge, but it progresses through to what we, what financial experience we have, experiences we have, and then what resulting financial behaviours um, form as a result of that. In addition to this, ASIC has also set a financial literacy strategy, a national financial literacy strategy, and that in turn is also going to, once we progress to capability nationally, that is going to extend its objectives to not just include knowledge, but also include some behavioural driven outcomes as well. So um, if you hear me using capability throughout the rest of the webinar, this is why. It's really just good practice. And I think as you go forward from here with your clients and with your local community, um, you'd be put in good stead by starting to use the term financial capability as well. Uh, lastly, for this wee section, um, getting our foundations together, um, it's definitely worth us touching on some key considerations when we think about kids and financial capability. Um, so I just want to quickly run through these. When we break down what's really required for a child or actually adult really to be financially capable, at a very high level, we're looking at for certain things. We're looking for basic numeracy skills so the ability to calculate, um, this goes hand in hand with financial capability. We want our kids to have a really good understanding of the benefits and risks associated with particular financial decisions, and also the ability to comprehend basic financial concepts. So we might be talking about compounding interest or something of that um, in that vein. I also want to point out that financial habits and attitudes which form behaviours, these begin to form at a really young age. So that's why bringing kids into the financial fold is so important. A 2014 OECD study actually found that kids start forming financial behaviours as young as seven years old. That's why when you as an advisor have clients come to you so ingrained, um, that explains a lot of it. The behaviour is the really hard thing to shift because it's been forming over all of those years. The knowledge piece of the financial capability equation is actually quite straightforward. Um, positive financial education does lead to higher financial product engagement. So an interesting correlation there. Um, as advisors, um, it's worth keeping that in the back of your mind. And lastly, to leave on this point, we're working within a totally different financial landscape to when you were a child and when I was a child. The main difference being that our currency, it's, it's disappeared before our eyes. We work with 
pretty much completely online and digital currency these days. And that creates a real educational barrier for kids. They no longer have this tangible asset. They don't have the coins, the notes that they can grasp onto. And they also don't see you transacting with physical currency either. They just see that classic pay pass tap, which is quite dangerous when it doesn't when it isn't contextualized. Um, so they're growing up in this different landscape and we need to ensure that when we educate them, we're respectful to that landscape. So financial education needs have actually changed a lot over the last uh, decade or couple of decades. So when we look at a few solutions later on, that's definitely going to be a key consideration of ours. All right, so that's a pretty quick rundown, hopefully getting everyone up to speed on what financial literacy is, um, some key considerations when we talk about youths and financial literacy or capability. Um, does that differ drastically to what you thought financial literacy was? Are you surprised by how, um, how nitpicky we get on the semantics behind everything? If you want to shoot me a question, feel free. I'll just wait a few seconds, see if there's anyone that wants to prompt anything. Otherwise, I'll, I'll move on to the next section. All right, seems like everyone's more than capable. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a quick snapshot of the current state of financial literacy here in Australia. Um, particularly, we're going to look at the financial literacy rates of young Australians. And we are actually talking about financial literacy here. This is um, a study we're going to use. It's called the OECD PISA Financial Literacy Study. It's conducted every three years and a number of OECD countries take part in this. And it's typically a knowledge-based assessment, but um, they also gather a bit of information around some of the financial products the kids are using as well. They don't dive into any behaviours, so the kids aren't really tracked on how they interact with those products, but we do have a comprehension of what products the kids are using. So to kick us off, um, we'll see that Australia actually performs pretty well in terms of students' financial literacy levels. These are kids 15 years old. Um, it's always 15 years old every single time the study's done every three years. And you'll see sort of, you know, what are we, a third of the way down, or actually a bit lower down, we've got Australia. And colour coded, you're seeing that we perform at that age group above the OECD average. Um, the issue is those are comparative statistics. And if you look at the raw data, we don't actually do too well. Our kids aren't really performing that well compared to any benchmark we may inherently set ourselves. Sure, we perform well against the United States, Chile, Peru, whoever it may be, but is that really the benchmark we want to set or do we have targets we as a nation want to achieve? Secondly, you'll see that we've dropped back over the last three years, our kids' financial literacy rates have, which is really alarming, I think. Um, I think this is, again, largely attributable to the fact that that currency is disappearing. Um, and we don't have appropriate education in place to deal with that shifting landscape. And lastly, we do have a snapshot here of what financial products and tools kids are using. So you'll see we're ranked second in the OECD countries that partook. Um, so our kids are really engaged with financial products in the financial world. So a heavy amount of experience. But if we don't, if we think back to that financial capability pyramid, are we preparing kids for this experience? Do we have that appropriate layer of financial knowledge before we progress through to um, experience and behaviours? So if I had to give Australia a grade, I'd sort of be looking at a C minus, I think. Um, we're not dead in the water by any means, but we've got a long way to go if we really want to aspire to be the economy that we can be, and education plays a massive part in this. So again, an opportunity for any questions, um, if there's any that come through. Does that surprise anyone? Did you think we were performing a lot better than, than that? Um, or is that about on par with what you're seeing in your local communities and with your clients? I'll just give a couple of seconds in case someone shoots through a question. Oh, great. Um, this is really relevant. So the question is, 
are there any current programs in schools? So we're absolutely going to dive into that in the next section. Um, and great, an awesome comment from Karen. It's what she's seeing in her local communities. So not surprising statistics, albeit unfortunate. And actually, I should mention, if we want to look at a comparison against adults in Australia, a recent Standard & Poor's survey, 2016, so just last year, um, found, well, actually, it celebrated the fact that Australia ranked ninth in the world for financial literacy. But again, if you rip back that raw data, we're talking about a 64% financial literacy rates amongst adult Australians. And if you wanted to look at that study, um, you'd actually see the barrier to what qualifies you as financial literacy, financially literate would surprise you. It's quite basic. Um, so to have just over majority of the population passing that, um, again, that's quite concerning. Um, Oh, great. So Karen's just commented about another good program that's being implemented next year in her local community. So we might as well just dive straight into that because I think that's what you're all here for. Um, so what we're going to start off with, we're going to look at six solutions that you can incorporate into your daily practice. Three of them are financial education products that can be used in schools and three are at home solutions as well. So we're going to kick off with the in school solutions. But first, let's ask, well, why do we need to put this in school? Um, I'm a strong advocate. I'm a little bit biased, obviously, with Banker, but I'm a strong advocate that school is a great place to house financial education and to take the bulk of the education. Um, we're in a society where parents don't have the time, the confidence or the capabilities or, you know, all three to teach their kids about financial education, yet it's cyclical in that majority of us learn how to be financially literate and capable from our parents. Um, majority of that, again, is through passive obs observation of our parents' financial behaviours. So if you get a negative trend, that's going to persist through the generations, and that's uh, you know a huge contributor to inequality in our societies. So if we house this in schools, we can offer a standardised solution and we can ensure that every single student who passes through the school gates will leave financially prepared for the world ahead of them when they um, step, step out again. Um, and Liz, who's here with me today, actually wrote a great blog on financial education in schools. And I'll link that on the cheat sheet, but it concludes with a bit of a judging criteria for selecting solutions. Things like educational quality, um, meeting the curriculum requirements, and that, uh, just to pause there, is a, a really big thing that you should get your head around before you set foot into a school. Um, schools are obviously constrained by a lot of things, but meeting curriculum requirements is a big thing. Very time poor. If you know any teachers, that's absolutely what you'll hear from them. So it, it's an, maybe perhaps an unfortunate truth, but you need to be ticking some boxes with the solutions that you take into a school. Um, other things are relevancy. We spoke about the fact that currency is going, becoming increasingly invisible. Um, so perhaps the old school techniques of printed out notes isn't really cutting it today. So that's another criteria. Um, we've also got the criteria of being unbiased and impartial, outcome driven, and co the cost effectiveness of the program should come into consideration as well. And I'll use these same criteria when we look through three in-school solutions. But before we dive into them, I just want to talk to the two different approaches to schools. So the first for you as an advisor. So the first um, obvious play is that you've got a bunch of clients who have school aged kids. So it could be appropriate that you suggest a relevant solution, in school solution to the parents of those kids, to your clients, and they can then get it into the schools. Um, and you may present to the school, you may be a conduit between the school, who knows. The other opportunity that exists is just reaching out to your local schools with a really authentic reason and a relevant resource. So I'll talk to those two different approaches when we look over these next three resources that follow. So we've already spoken about ASIC and the role they play in setting the National Financial Literacy Strategy, um, but they've actually built out a suite of resources on the, the Money Swap Smart website as well. Um, so I would be strongly advising you to check out these resources. They are a bit more traditional in approach. So we're talking about books, we're talking about lesson plans and online games, um, somewhat interactive, but a lot is also paper-based. 
It's clearly unbiased and, of course, it's free. Um, what's particularly unique about this in-school solution is that it offers teachers a lot of in-person support and professional development. Now, one weakness in schools and making schools the appropriate home for financial education is that teachers didn't really get taught the fi financial fundamentals when they went through teachers college. So teachers themselves, just like parents, aren't prepared, confident or willing to incorporate into this, this into the everyday classroom. Um, that said, it's in the curriculum, so really what they need is someone to offer them the support and ASIC does a really good job of doing that through professional development courses and through um, liaising with project officers who do offer the one-on-one -on -one support if you need it. This is suitable for primary and high schools and it's mapped to both the national curriculum, um, I think it may dive down into some state level curriculum, and it's also mapped to the national consumer financial literacy framework. That's a big, yeah, that's, that's a big ac acronym. Um, but what that is, it's an aside to the curriculum that schools can adopt um, that focuses purely on financial literacy. Now, as you know, nothing that's not compulsory in the curriculum by any means, but it's there. So it really does give parents some leverage. If the school isn't incorporating financial literacy at all, um, then let your clients know who have young kids that they have the right to ask for it. It exists in the curriculum and there are resources there for them. Um, I, as an advisor, I would specifically be introducing this to any of my clients who's kids' schools are particularly, um, they might need a lot of support in terms of financial literacy, so they may just be getting going on their journey, or perhaps are a bit sceptical about whether financial literacy will play a, a lasting role in their curriculum. Um, and as an advisor, apart from introducing this to your clients, there's also an opportunity for you to get involved with local schools that are utilizing Money Smart in their school. So there's a, a link um, to all of the Money Smart schools who use these resources um, throughout the entire school. So they've really adopted them. And I'll include that in the cheat sheet. But if there's any in your local area, I think it'll be worth reaching out to them to see how they incorporate this into their curriculum. And perhaps you could then go and approach a school who doesn't. Um, like I say, one real main barrier for teachers is that they're not confident to deliver financial education themselves or they just want a support person. Um, so that's a real role that someone like yourself could play. All right. And we'll have questions about all six of these resources at the end of um, each, at the end of the section. The second resource I want to talk about is called Club Kidpreneur. Um, and this exudes learning by doing. As you can see, the kids go into business at small scale. Um, they receive uh, a small form of education, so it's mostly practical, but there is some education through mentoring. And there are several ways that you as an educator could get involved. Um, I think this would be great to recommend to clients whose kids show a natural inclination towards business. Um, this is pitched still at quite a young age, year four and six, but kids do show a tendency quite early on if they are business minded. Um, another idea is there's a cost associated. You as a firm may sponsor one of your local schools to partake. We've heard some really great things coming from this system. Um, or you could become a more formal mentor as well. They do have the opportunity for anyone who's, um, who has the appropriate background to apply to be a mentor for Club Kidpreneur. So that may be facilitating workshops, it may be getting into schools, um, it may be mentoring a bunch of kids, judging, um, who knows, but there's a lot of avenues for you to explore there. Um, and as an advisor, um, if I were wanting to extend my reach and my contribution to the local community, I think this would be a, a really tangible way to start that. And third and finally, in terms of in at school solutions, we have Banker. Um, so Banker, as I said, is an online financial education platform for kids, and it really does emerge kids into the financial art world. It essentially exposes them to all of the financial experiences that you, me, and your clients face day to day, and it does it in a simulated kind of way. 
Um, so you'll see from the image on screen, kids all have their own online bank account. They have two, uh, two accounts, savings and expenses. They can buy property. Um, they get an overall view of their net wealth. There's, it's gamified a little bit through leaderboards as well. Um, but as an online data-driven platform, we also are able to measure our impact quite effectively. And that's perhaps where some of the other more traditional solutions aren't able to. Um, we can measure financial literacy rates through an entry and exit quiz. And we also track a bunch of financial behaviours which align with the national strategy's capabilities. Um, we're unbiased. We're an education company. We do partner with a number of organisations who believe in our mission, um, but it's really important to us that we remain unbiased. There's another in-school solution that I haven't touched on today, mostly because I felt it wasn't as relevant because there's not so much of a way to you, for you as advisors to get involved, but you all have heard of Dolomites. Um, it's prolific throughout Australian schools, um, but they have come under fire a little bit recently due to, I guess, essentially not being unbiased. So it's something that we really want to stress, and we've got our curriculum links as well. Um, but what I really want to talk to is how you can get involved as an advisor. So we've built out a suite of tools to ensure that advisors can take banker to local schools in their communities and be as involved or not so much as you want. So if you in introduce this to a local school, we can connect you with their account, giving you some visibility over their progress through. And what that does is it gives you authentic touch points to drop into that school or that classroom. Um, so for example, the teacher may have introduced a new financial concept and you would be pinged and you may reach out to that teacher and say, hey, I see you've just enabled purchasing property in Banker. Um, would it suit you if I come in and have a chat with the kids? And from all of our experience to date, the teachers absolutely love that. Um, it makes it more relevant and real for the kids. Um, in terms of going into schools, speaking to all three solutions here, um, we have found it probably the most effective way of going into schools is actually reaching out at the teacher level. Unless you've got a really strong relationship with the local school at principal level, um, teachers are the ones that have to implement the solutions and often they're not done across the entire school. So we may have a banker classroom or two banker classrooms in one school, but there's not widespread adoption. This is to do, this is to do with the flexibility of the curriculum. Teachers are afforded quite a lot of flexibility and they can adopt programs that suit their classroom. So if you want the most buy-in, it's actually best to go to the person at the coalface who'll be making those program decisions. So if it's you know Money Smart, um, if it's Club Kidpreneur, whatever it may be, um, our, our findings are that going and approaching the teachers is the most effective way. Um, and lastly, with Banker, we also have the ability to tie it into the parents. So if you didn't want to go and introduce Banker at a school level and be involved at, at the school level um, or even the classroom level, you could also introduce it to one of your clients who you feel this would be appropriate for and they would get a view over what we call our parent portal and you could sort of be involved in that conversation um, in that way. Cool. Um, so those were the three in-school solutions. But as I said earlier, everyone has a role to play in um, financial education. Although I believe that school is a great starting point, um, parents have a perfectly primed to teach kids uh, financial experience and to also be involved in some of those money first. So the first bank account um, and all of those, the first savings, whatever it may be. So what we're going to do now is look at three in-home solutions. Um, and I think these will be a little bit more relevant to you as advisors because there's that direct link between you, these platforms and your clients. First up, we've got Pennybox. It was built by two Australians actually, two Australian guys. One's an ex-Googler and the other's an ex-financial analyst. Um, Pennybox, as it says, is the modern day equivalent for pocket money. It sort of takes that three jar approach um, and it puts it online. It also makes it more relevant in terms of where we're heading with the digital cashless future. 
and it's super engaging. I've actually used it with um, my younger brother and we had a lot of fun creating the tasks and then awarding the payments. Um, and obviously it's quite interactive. You can add photos. It's, it's an enjoyable experience. And if your clients have a number of kids, they can all be synced up to the same app as well. So it's quite intuitive. It's worth noting though, that this is a financial experience app. So I wouldn't go as far as calling this a financial education tool like I would something like Banker because they're not getting the education that sits behind enacting that experience. So this provides you with the perfect opportunity. Um, you can be that educator in this conversation with your client and their kids. You could sit down, look over their penny box activities for the month and you could offer some advice. And I think um, that would be a great way of engaging different family members into the financial fold. Um, I would certainly recommend Pennybox as sort of a beginner in-home solution. Kids perhaps 10 years old and younger um, before you progress on to, to something more substantial. But it really is relevant for the kids. So it ticks and it's unbiased. This is an education company. They've got no affiliation with any financial organization. So it ticks a lot of our criteria as far as I'm aware. So if that's at one end of the spectrum, I want to shoot right down to the other and talk about money school. Um, I'm not sure if this will be that relevant to you know, everyone's clients because I assume your clients are quite time poor. But if you did have a client who was particularly engaged and involved with their child's education, then this is exactly what you're looking for. This is an intensive program that runs parents and kids hands in hand through a bit of a financial boot camp. Um, they enroll and they go through the activities together. So what you need to do is to consider who this would be appropriate for and whether they have the time really. Because from what I've, I haven't gone and done the program, but I've spoken to a couple of parents who have, it is quite a commitment, um, but it will suit a small subset of clients out there. And as an advisor, as an aside, this, there is also opportunities for you to get involved in money school at a, a local level, I believe. Again, similar to Club Kidpreneur, um, you can be a mentor or an advisor or an attendee at one of the workshops. I'm not quite sure, but there's definitely an opportunity there. So regional support is an opportunity for you to get in front of people who are actively involved in their kids' financial education and probably you know, their own financial education as well. And lastly, the last in-home solution I want to talk about today is Spriggy. Um, so Spriggy is a prepaid card for 8 to 18 year olds that lets them sort of experience the responsibilities that come with earning and spending cash. So I would look at this as a step up from, um, from the first one we looked at together um, from Pennybox. I think that this really is a good progression on age-wise and also responsibility and experience-wise. Again, it was developed by two Australian boys. Um, Spriggy actually have some incredible backing from Australian entrepreneurs and investors, and they've done really well this year in terms of their growth as well. So parents are really liking it. But still, when I'm out in the local communities talking to people about it, um, you know, it's still something that parents haven't heard of haven't heard of and they're looking for something like this. I would categorize this again like penny box as financial experience and so again that same opportunity exists for you there but perhaps that's even more enhanced as an advisor because here we're talking about real tangible currency. This isn't like penny box where in effect they're just numbers on a screen and you cash it out for your, your child or put it into the bank account. This is real money that your the parent is preloading onto a card and that child is then able to spend. Um, so it's really it's in need of the education piece. And if the kid or the student isn't getting that at school, then there's a, an awesome opportunity for advisors to, to introduce that themselves. Um, and just a quick note, I reached out to the Spriggy guys um, and told them that I was presenting this webinar. And they said that you could use a code when you signed up, a promo code. So if you have clients that do like the sound of Spriggy, they can sign up with the promo code BANKER. So it's in the bottom left hand corner of your screen next to the flying pig, uh, all caps. And when they receive the card, that will have $5 preloaded onto it. Um, so we don't 
just to be clear, bank is not receiving any kickbacks from that or anything. It's purely for the benefit of you and your clients and their kids. Um, but I thought it was really cool that they got back to us and set up that code. Um, so Spriggy again ticks a lot of the boxes for us. You'll see there is an associated cost as well. Um, so it loses a little bit of points there, um, but you know, it's a business. So we've run through six offerings um, at somewhat at pace. So are there any questions now about any of those particular offerings or any of the criteria I've used to judge them by? Cool, I'll wait a couple more seconds. And these will all be on the cheat sheet as well. Great, all right, let's progress on. And let's talk about how you then can take those resources to extend your offering. Um, we've looked at six quite diverse offerings now. Um, so you'll see that there's no one solution for children out there. It has to be a bit of a mixed bag. And first up, I've got to say that this task I'm about to talk about, it really shouldn't be outsourced. Um, you know your client base the best and to get the most out of this exercise, I think it's best for advisors themselves to do this. And what I'm talking about is building a financial capability toolbox. So taking those six resources we just looked at and also doing your own research, there are a lot more resources out there, both in school and at home that are suitable, and building out this toolbox that will suit your client base. Um, for example, you may add Spriggy to the mix, but you may want to complement that with an educational piece by getting money smart into your client's school. Um, the best way to make a start on this is by profiling your client base. So you may have a large proportion of clients who are time poor young families, and they'll have one particular set of tools that you'll put in your toolbox for them. Or you may have an education heavy family who like to be heavily involved in anything education related with their kids, so it may be an all in-home solution for, for that profile of client. Um, I've also got several different criteria here that you should be thinking through when you're building out your toolkit. So there's some key things if you're going into school, which is that alignment to the curriculum and the cost of implementation. And there's some other key things just generally across the board, like age, appropriate, age appropriateness and that experience versus education. So step one, we build out our profiles. Step two is we pick the different resources that are suitable and we attribute them to the different profiles that we've built out. And you are going to need to do some of your own research, as I said. And then you'll have a few gaps that exist. And this takes us on to step three, which is to build a little bit of your own content. So I really do think there's a lot of opportunity, in particular with those in-home solutions for advisors out there, to build some bridging or supportive material. Um, it's waiting to be created, really. And I'll go as far to reach as reaching out to the guys at Pennybox or Spriggy um, or whatever takes your fancy to see if there's any way they can aid you in this because the incentives really align between you offering these solutions to your clients so that their kids become more financially educated from a young age and their tools being adopted um, all throughout Australia. We built some content earlier this year um, that was really successful. One thing we did before we released that content or actually before we even started with that content was doing a little bit of an, a, a scan of the current ecosystem and what existed out there. Um, because the last thing I think any of us want to do is to recreate the wheel. There's so much out there in this space already. Um, and if there is a resource you can use, I would highly suggest you just use that. It doesn't really matter about logos. This is a huge problem and it's gonna take a big solution to tackle it, financial illiteracy. Um, so definitely look, do an environmental scan first, but if there's an opportunity for you there that's gonna be really bespoke for your clients and it's gonna be that bridge between the tool that exists and what your clients need, go for it. Um, before we built this piece of content as well, we also designed it as reusable. I would highly suggest where you can to offer, to make content as reusable, do it. Um, it's gonna save you time in the long run. Financial education, I'm sure it'll be important to you guys, but it's, it's not your core business. So you need to be mindful about the time you spend doing that. 
The best content you can get though is client created content. So if you can provide your clients with a platform to do this, then that's going to be really successful and it's going to drive itself. We've got on Banker, we've got the Banker community and that's where we allow our teachers a place to put any points of inspiration. So if they've used our software really creatively and it's worked effectively in the classroom, we provide them with that platform to share that with the rest of the teaching world. Um, and so again, if you can get your clients really engaged and thinking about financial literacy in the same way, you'd be surprised with what they can create for you that then you can use for the rest of your client base. Um, and lastly, um, there's quite a few people attending this webinar today. So don't feel you have to compete with one another. You can collaborate and do some great things. We obviously work with NetWealth. Um, we work with a number of different partners to deliver some awesome things. The video we created, we worked with a partner to, let, um, to launch and we got 20k views in the first week and that really blew us, um, blew our expectations out of the water. So you can, can make big differences when you work together. So when you've added your personal toolbox, um, stand back and have a look at it and check it against the criteria here because I think it can be quite easy to create a toolbox that is biased to your expectations or your financial literacy levels. So let people dive in, have a play around and critique yourself against these criteria here. They should act as a good yardstick as to whether you're on the right track in terms of your toolbox. But know that your toolbox as an advisor will be ever evolving. There's new financial education products coming out. It, it seems like almost monthly now, there are new resources coming out, you'll start creating your content, your client base may shift as well. Um, so it's gonna be a, a moving beast, your toolbox. So make sure you're constantly going back to it as well. Great, so that concludes the webinar today. I hope you found it um, valuable and that you can walk away confident and engaging with financial literacy with your client base and with those in your community and you can have an, now have an eye to how you might start building out your toolbox as well. And like I said, I'll be circulating, or NetWealth will be circulating that cheat sheet as well. So perhaps before we go, do we have time for any questions and answers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one question that came through is um, from Grant, and he said, I did workshops for year 12s in this last term and we'll be doing the same next year. I'm also looking to start doing local community workshops for Gen X and Y. Mm. Is there any content to help with that? Yeah, existing content for secondary schools is essentially the question. There is. Um, it depends what your objective is for the workshop, but there are a number of resources. I mean, Money Smart is a good place to look. They've got a bunch of resources that align to the curriculum. Um, it depends if your workshops require you to align to the curriculum, if they're assessment based. Um, I feel that would be a good place to start. Um, but let me take a note down, Grant, and I'll include a little bit on that cheat sheet as well, in particular around workshops in secondary schools. Um, another one we got through, uh, are, you are you running any interactive webinars on how Banker actually runs so that we can have a good knowledge before approaching schools? Yeah, really good question. Um, Liz actually runs those, so I'll let yeah. Liz answer. So I run webinars for Banker um, well, pretty frequently. We'll do one every couple of months. Um, so we'll do a, there's one uh, loaded on the YouTube channel at the moment on the basics of Banker. So that's how to establish the basic economy in the classroom. Uh, we have we start with the, the basic income for turning up to class and adhering to the class value system, uh, and then students um, have class discussion around what expenses are expected to be paid, and we'll set up um, some automatic payments for that, and then a, a good module to enable early on is interest on savings. So that's the bones of Banker, um, and once you've got that established, you'll have a, a currency running. Um, and, and it can essentially run in the background of the classroom. So teachers that are time time poor can um, establish it in, within an hour and, um, and students can log on to uh, observe the flow of money into and out of, out of their account. And from there, we'll be uh, adding to that um, and, and doing webinars on how to enable the modules and how to simulate some of the uh, experience, financial experiences in the classroom with some uh, ideas and inspiration because there's plenty out there. We get um, <laughs> stories from teachers all the time with really creative applications um, for yeah, those, 
those concepts. I'm also going to be adding Liz's contact details to the cheat sheet. And Liz, you often reach out to particularly passionate advisors who are wanting to and you know, introduce bank to schools, would you be happy to Skype with them or have a phone call about yeah. how they can get started? Absolutely. So I'm um, I'm pretty flexible. Um, uh, as Kendall said, she'll um, put my email in there. Please get in touch. Um, I'm more than happy to arrange time to Skype, share my screen with you. We can give, I'll give you a demonstration of the platform. Um, and we can just talk about um, financial education and classrooms in general. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm available. Great. Um, so an, another one, uh, does the Australian government have any plans to start anything new in schools that you know of? Uh, so themselves, not that I know of, um, you know, that doesn't mean no. Um, I believe ASIC's main role in the Financial Literacy Board is to set that high level strategy and to oversee that it's being implemented and that's largely by external parties um, like ourselves, um, like Spriggy, like Penny Box as well. So not not that I know of, um, but who knows. Great, thank you. Um, so that's all we have for today. Um, thanks so much for coming by, Kendall and Liz, and, and for um, ending our webinar series for 2017. Great presentation. Um, We'll be sending across the slides the webinar recording and a podcast recording of this presentation. Um, so keep an eye out in the next week for that for that email. Thanks very much, everyone, and look forward to talking with you next year.